<laughs> uh, there is an outline in your program on what we're going to be dealing with here. And uh, as you see, the title is Finding a Role in God's Assembly, Not Just Being on the Role. I've used the expression finding a role rather than the word gift. The word gift is a bit, uh, has a kind of a forbidding type of connotation to it. And uh, people think a gift. I, I, but everyone, if we think of the, we're not going to read it, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, rather 12, rather, Paul, through the Spirit of God, applies the idea of a body in three different ways. He speaks of the church, the body of Christ, which embraces every believer who has been saved from the day of Pentecost until the Lord comes. He speaks then of a human body, any, any human body and how it functions, its uh, cooperative functioning together. And then he takes that imagery and makes a quantum leap and applies it to a local assembly. So if we understand that a local assembly has body-like character, we will then appreciate that just as every part of your body has a role to play, please don't tell me about vestigial organs, just as every part of your body has a role to play, so every believer has a role in God's assembly. And that's what we're looking at under the four headings we have, the what is required, what is demand placed upon us, the discipleship that is required, how it is developed, and finally, uh, rather than the how to discover your role in God's assembly. Now, we'll just look at a few scriptures for the sake of time. Mark chapter 1, first of all, the call of the disciples, and we'll just notice something there. Maybe just break in verse 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, this is the Lord Jesus, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Just want to stress the order there. First of all, come after me, and then I will make you fishers of men. Look in Romans chapter 12. And verse number 1, Romans 12 and verse number 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world or this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, it's not by mere accident that what follows immediately is the development of gift in a local assembly. And we'll see then the, the link between these two passages. Finally, 1 Peter. There are many, many passages we could take time to read, but 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse number 10. As every man hath received the gift even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And we know that God will add his blessing to the public reading of his word. So as intimated, the subject before us is the issue of finding a role in God's assembly. Not just being there, not just showing up for meetings, as vital as that is, but how can I be a help in God's assembly? It may come as a surprise to you if newly saved and a younger believer, but God has a role for every believer in the assembly. Some way you can contribute to the welfare and the well-being of the testimony for God. And that's what we're going to be looking at, looking first of all here in what we have in Romans chapter 12 of what is required. And as you have on your outline, and we'll look at this together, so our brethren will come in with some of these other areas. But the first thing we want to mention is commitment. Now, we want to take it from there. I hope we don't sound like old fogies condemning current society. But I think it hardly needs to be said that one of the mantras of our current society is keep all your options open. Don't get committed. 
If you are going to be a help in God's assembly, the first thing is you must be committed. So that Paul then begins in chapter 12 with this request, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. All that he has mentioned from chapter 1 through to chapter 11, ending in that great crescendo doxology at the end of chapter 11, giving thanks to God for his wisdom, his mercy, his grace, his kindness. Now he says, in light of all of that, I want you to be a committed believer, willing to give yourself to the service of God. Our brother has touched on that already so eloquently in Philippians chapter 2. And again, it is emphasized here for us. If you break this chapter down, you'll notice then that the consecration that he brings you to at the beginning of the chapter. Then he brings you the capability, different gifts that are given, the capability endowed. Then he comes in verse 9 down to the end of the chapter, that as a result of that there is character that is developed, character that is exhibited and displayed in, as a result of where we begin this chapter. Frequently we hear about lives being put on the altar for God. I don't think that's quite the accurate picture at the beginning of this chapter. I think if you want a real accurate picture of where we are in Romans chapter 12 in the Old Testament, it will be the Levites assembling at the door of the tabernacle, presenting themselves there for service for God. Their lives totally committed, giving up, giving up a lot of different things. We've heard about that already. The willingness to give up the legitimate, the normal, in order, in order to be of more use for God. And so we're reminded here, the first thing is the need for commitment. Linked with that, then, is to see things as God sees them. Now, we're not just beating each other's drums and making each other sound good, but that's exactly what our brother Usher has been bringing before us. Your mind needs to be renewed, the renewing of your mind. Now, our minds have been renewed at conversion. The idea of a renewed mind is, is mentioned in different ways. Titus chapter 3 and uh, Ephesians chapter 4 here it is something that is ongoing. So every time you open up the Word of God in the morning and read it, hopefully your mind is being renewed. You are beginning to see things as God sees them, to value what God values. Every day as we rub shoulders, as we are bombarded with all the messages of the media, from billboards that we see, from advertisements that we hear, our minds are bombarded with a certain cultural bias. What you deserve what you ought to have, how you should be aggressive, how you sh and I don't need to go, you know what I'm saying. And we are counterculture to all of that, totally. And our minds need to be renewed as a result of the Word of God. So we need this before we can begin to serve or begin to think about finding my role in God's assembly. So my, my mind is adjusted. My values are now adjusted. Others become more important than just self-indulgence, as we've heard. And as well, we realize that eternity has far more value than time. And we begin then to invest in what really is going to be important and what is going to be of value. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is the chapter, the only chapter in our Bible that describes a ministry meeting. How gift is displayed or how usefulness is displayed in ministry. In that chapter, you have more mentions of speaking. I think there are something like 18 different mentions of speaking. And you have more mentions of the word edification than in any other chapter in your Bible. So speaking to edification, when it comes to the assembly and audible participation, my goal is upon edific edifying others, building up others, not upon displaying my gift, not about displaying my eloquence, my oratorical skills. It's others that are in view. And it's edifying that is in view. And so all of those things then come into balance. We read in 1 Peter chapter 4, as good stewards, as good stewards, that means a responsibility and an accountability. It is required in a steward that a man be found faithful. Now, I don't know if this, I may have to face this myself, but let me just ask you, what would it be like to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and to realize, I never, never fulfilled the role that God had saved me to fulfill. 
I wasted my life. Maybe because I thought, well, if I don't have that brother's gift, that sister's gift, then what's the use of doing anything? As good stewards. Now, that also tells us that it's something been given to us. Now, we'll speak about developing your gift, but first, it comes from God. It's part of the, it's part of the manifold grace of God. It's an undeserved blessing that God has given to us, the opportunity to be a help in the assembly in some way. And whatever it may be, it's really a very small thing. You recall, relative to the um, parable, of, I get them, the parable of the talents, thou hast been faithful in very little. Very little. So no matter how much you think you're doing for God, it is very little in the broad scheme of all God is doing relative to his work in this world through the last 2,000 years. He's done it without me. He'll do it, continue to do it without me. And really, we're privileged to have a very small role, a little place to play in what God has done. But also, 1 Peter chapter 4 brings another, two other things at least before us. As every man has received the gift, even so let him minister <clears throat> the same. The same. That means I am not responsible for Andrew's gift or for our brother Baker's gift. I'm responsible for whatever role God has given me to do. I am to minister the same, not someone else's gift. So for me to sit back and say, well, because I don't have the ability to speak as he does, I don't have the skill in the gospel as he does, I'm not a good, as good a personal worker as she is, then I minister the same. God has given you something to do, and we're going to be talking here, our brother are going to be adding to it, how we come to understand what that ability is, what that role is. But you are responsible to do what God has given you to do, not what God has given someone else to do. Even so, minister the same one to another. You notice the direction? God gives no gifts for me to waste on myself or as a sign that somehow I am a special Christian. That really is the death knell to Pentecostal blessing. There is never a blessing that God gives, never a gift that God gives, that somehow is to make me feel as though now I am filled with the Spirit and I am really, really a mature Christian. Every gift is given for your benefit, the benefit of others, not for my benefit. So that's just some initial groundwork. Our brother Andrew is going to take up the importance of discipleship in this great matter of finding a role to play in God's assembly. Our brother Joseph is going to deal with the development of your gift. How do I, I feel that God has given me this work to do? I feel I can be a help to the assembly in this way. How do I develop my gift? And we'll just talk also about some examples in scripture of those who were able to be brought into a sphere of usefulness. Maybe not so much by consciously going after it, but by God opening doors and God bringing them into spheres of usefulness almost imperceptibly. They just came into it as a result of the leading and the control of God in their lives and their own personal exercise. So that's just a broad overview of what we're going to be looking at. And I'm going to turn in our brother Andrew and ask him to add to what I have said and then he can touch as well on the subject of discipleship. I think the, the main point uh, that Sandy started with, the idea of commitment, is key to understanding. Um, again, not to, to harp on the current age, but it's good to acknowledge that the mindset of the age creeps its way into our thinking. And there is definitely a sentiment today, whether it's to do with, uh, for example, employment, uh, employees nowadays, any management school will tell you, that the generation now is very different than it used to be and the whole concept that there's a commitment for life and a lifelong career is completely uh, something a relic of the past and that it's a two-way street and that people are unlikely to be in a committed relationship with one employer for an extended <coughs> period of time and I'm not decrying that I'm just saying that's a fact so the, the idea nowadays of commitment to something unconditionally, or wholeheartedly, maybe is a better word, um, is becoming increasingly foreign. And you see the same, for example, in marriages, where it's sort of a, if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, as long as we're all happy, it's fine. Um, when it comes to assembly, 
functioning, uh, it's important, I think, to understand that it's not that I conditionally commit once I'm confident what my role is. Like I, I go to, you know, come and go from the meetings and I'm part of an assembly. And, you know, once I sort of figure out what they want me to do and how they value my inputs and what opportunities they provide me, uh, then I'll sort of figure out how committed I am. I think the way Sandy has laid out the outline here is very good, which is, uh, first of all, my membership in an assembly is first and foremost out of obedience to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what gathering to his name means. And because that is what draws me to the fellowship of an assembly, I am committed to that assembly. And that commitment forms the foundation prior to really even necessarily knowing specifically what role I will fulfill. So I would just sort of sound a real um, exclamatory note on the, the concept of commitment, that it is something which is necessary. I, I also would say it's something which is measurable. And I don't mean measurable in others, okay? I'm not saying create a culture and assembly where, you know, I keep a, a attendance registry and I have in my mind a very clear you know, scale of one to 10 of who the committed believers are. That's not at all what I'm suggesting. I'm suggesting for myself. It's possible to fool myself into thinking that I'm committed to an assembly when all of the evidence indicates otherwise. So I think a healthy thing is to challenge your own. I'm a member of the assembly that meets in Newmarket Gospel Hall. Am I committed to that assembly? There's a number of very good ways to measure that. Attendance at public meetings is certainly one of them. I don't think we should decry that and throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, that's absolutely a way to measure my commitment. It's not the only one. Do I love the believers with whom I break bread? You say, well, I got nothing against any of them. No, that's not the question. The question is, do I love them actively? Am I interested in their well-being? Do I pray for them? Do I interact with them? Do I communicate with them? There's many ways to measure commitment. And I would suggest before you get too preoccupied with what specifically should I do, can I do, am I being given the opportunity to do, step back a little and look at commitment. If you are wholeheartedly, hook, line, and sinker, life poured in to the building up of a company of God's people, you will get opportunities to contribute to that assembly. But it starts with commitment. Anything you add? Uh, I would just say that I think... Uh, one of the things I echo with what you said, gift can sometimes seem like, uh, I know when I started doing, uh, preaching the gospel here and there, people would say, you're gifted. And to me, that sounded like you're talented. Or um, just like someone can throw a good spiral, you can preach the gospel. And uh, I remember the day when an older brother took my hand and said, God has entrusted you with a gift. And that changed everything. It was no longer, I'm talented. It was, as you've said, a stewardship that then is very sobering, as uh, you guys have been saying here. That's why it requires the commitment and, and what follows here. So it's not as a flowery and maybe nice as it seems when you hear of gift. Um, so that's all I would say. Okay. <clears throat> Want to go with discipleship for us as time is moving? Sure. We're just going to put the clock out there, but I'll do that after. Um, the concept of discipleship is, I don't know, when you hear that term, discipleship, I don't know what that conjures up in your mind. What do you think discipleship is? Uh, one of the passages, there's a number of passages in the public teaching of the Lord Jesus, especially to, directly to his disciples and sometimes to the, the crowd, that lay out, if I can say this reverently, his concept of discipleship. He, he explained very clearly what discipleship was, and it usually was in pretty drastic terms. So, for example, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So, again, the bullet points that Sandy has down here are very, very valid. Follow me. It begins, again, before he makes you a fisher of men, before he makes you something he's going to use, there is the initial step of following him. The two greatest sort of elements of meaning or components of meaning in the idea of discipleship, biblically, is the idea of following and learning 
and likeness, if you want to add a third one. It's following and learning and then reflecting the character of the one whose disciple you are. So when it comes to, to functioning in a local assembly, loyalty to Christ is absolutely vital. That's the follow me. That's the take up your cross daily, deny yourself and follow him. You look at the initial disciples. Their lives were never the same after they heeded the call. Are you prepared for that level of unconditional, wholehearted commitment? That's what it is to be in an assembly. I mentioned earlier today some of my, maybe I'm getting sentimental in my old age, I don't know, but I've reflected back over some of the examples the Lord has given me in my own life. My dad died, it'll be uh, last July, or two years ago in July, July 2019, given me a lot of time to reflect on his life. The overseers that were in the assembly when I grew up, all of them but one, are now dead. I look back at men and women, some of the, the single women in our assembly and the wives of the overseers, they were disciples, modern day disciples. They lived, ate, breathed, slept the functioning of the assembly that I grew up in. You could not take Brackendale assembly away from those people and have anything remotely resembling their life remain. Everything about them revolved around the functioning of that assembly. Not just attending the meetings, but interwoven into the lives of all of the people. They're the people I grew up admiring. I wish that was truer of my life. But lives that are poured in. The, the final point that I'll say on discipleship is this, the last one, likeness to Christ. And just a few little things that I enjoy meditating on this this week. If I think that Christ is the one that I am to be like in my uh, service in an assembly, what are the characteristics of, of his service that should then sort of be replicated in mine? Well, the first one is, as we've heard a lot of already, <coughs> selflessness. The idea that he did not come to serve himself. The Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve. Great motto in assembly life. If you come to the assembly, as a John F. Kennedy, I think one of your presidents that said, don't ask what can my country do for me, but ask what I can do for my country. A much more biblical quote is, the Son of Man came not to serve, but uh, not to be served, but to serve. Take that motto into your assembly. Don't go there like a sponge saying, an assembly is a place where there's supposed to be a lot of love. Hey, I don't feel love. An assembly is a place where we're all supposed to be fed. Hey, I don't feel fed. Don't approach an assembly like a sponge saying, I'm here to receive. Approach an assembly as a sphere to be used, to serve. And it'll be life transforming in terms of your own experience and usefulness within that assembly. Selflessness. Another feature of the Lord's service. There was a long period of relative obscurity before he ever entered the public eye in service roughly 30 years, growing up in a home in Nazareth. Now, I am not saying that that was uh, worthless, far from it. I'm not saying that that was undervalued or unvalued, far from it. 33 years, if we'd use that as an approximation, 33 years of incomparable fruitfulness in a life. Three of those, we get a little glimpse into what happened publicly. The vast majority of your usefulness in assembly life is going to be what people don't see. It's not going to be in the public eye. And the third thing I would say um, about the service of the Lord Jesus, if I'm going to be like my master as a disciple, the third thing is who he was is what gave value to what he did. Who he was is what gave value to what he did. His character, God manifest in flesh, the sterling purity of the character of Christ is what gave meaning and value to all of the activity that marked his service for God. That has to be true of you and it has to be true of me if our functioning and assembly life is going to amount to anything. So that's just a few. There's many more you can get. But a few things along this idea of discipleship follows along with the idea of commitment, loyalty to Christ, love for him, ongoing, and then likeness to him in the way that I approach my service in assembly life. So you may have much more to add. I'm sure you have it all alliterated, Sandy.
<laughs> On the literature, do you have anything? No. No, no the only thing, again, to just <coughs> emphasize what has been said, the first thing is follow me, mm -hmm. and the Lord Jesus Christ says, I will make you. He takes full responsibility for making you what he wants you to be. Now, we have to cooperate, but really, he does the making. <coughs> and my resp first responsibility is following him and loyalty to him. I don't want to get too far, too, too sidetracked, but you can think of a person in the Old Testament who had, was endowed with a wonderful gift by the name of Samson. But his gift was always used for self, not for God. God mercifully used him despite his self-centered gift. You recall how, you know, he cries to God, just this once, let me die with the... He, everything was all for self. He extracts himself from a trap situation that folly got him into by taking the gates of the, of the city and the bars and carrying out to Hebron and so on. He's using strength. He's using a, a gift with a wrong motive. So the potential of taking something God has given and using it for the wrong reason. Discipleship, love for Christ will help us to be preserved from any tendency to misuse gift for self. Let me talk then for a few moments about the issue about, well, fine, how will I know what I'm supposed to be doing and how will I fall into this sphere of usefulness that God has for me? Maybe some young Christians here are asking that question. I, I'm just one in a large assembly. We have, I can't preach, I'm not, uh, I'm not eloquent, I, and so on, all the different reasons we can give. And we're speaking both to sisters and to Brethren, everyone has a role to play in God's assembly. So the first thing is, become aware of the needs. What needs are there in the assembly? Easy to sit back and complain. There's no one here to bring children into Sunday school. There's no one here that is able to teach in the Bible reading. There's no one here that can preach the gospel. And on and on we go. What need do you see in the assembly where God has placed you? Now, that doesn't mean you automatically get up and start being a teacher at the age of 16. But it does mean if you see that need, then perhaps it's time to start getting down to your Bible and learning your Bible, spending hours with your Bible instead of with your cell phone. So becoming aware of the need. Secondly, be available to meet the need. God is not looking for consultants. He's looking for committed individuals, one who, those who want to contribute, not just consult. So am I available? Now, along with other things, this is a very busy age in which we live. And yet, if you think of it, your ancestors worked 12 hours a day. Some of them worked six days a week. They didn't have an automobile to take them to meeting. Many of them walked a mile or two or more to meeting or had other means of transportation. If you're back in Ireland, they went on bikes, okay? Uh, they didn't have all the conveniences we have. We have a lot of distractions. It's what we have. And so we have the idea that we're very busy. If you're too busy for what God has asked you to do, then you're much busier than God intended you to be. And it's time to scale back somewhere. And there are men in the audience, as well as the man to my right, who have had very busy business lives and yet have put spiritual things first and have found time to be available to meet needs that they see arise. So being aware, being available, then become active in trying to meet that need. If you think our Sunday school is dwindling, no one's here to bring in children, then do something about it. If you feel that our Bible reading is pretty dull and the men go on in Greek and all the tenses and all and it's maybe just find a few think of a few good questions that'll keep them on track in the Bible reading and ask those questions in a humble way and hopefully help them in that way if you feel you're old enough to begin to contribute to the Bible reading then do that as well but find your role find your place and how you can be a help there and then be approachable what that means is allow other believers to come along and say, 
I think really you could fill a better niche somewhere else. I think you could do this, or they'll encourage you, as they've done with our brother Joe next to me. So be approachable. Don't, don't be touchy. Don't feel as though I tried to do that. They didn't appreciate it. I'm not going to do anything else. Forget it. I tried. No. Be approachable and allow others to give you counsel and to give you help and advice. Now let me put some flesh on that from an Old Testament picture. There's a young girl in the land of Moab. Her name is Ruth. She doesn't know it. But God intends for her, a Gentile, idol worshiper in the land of Moab, to become one of the individuals, one of the four women mentioned in Matthew 1, who will be in the line of the Messiah. Big jump to go from point A all the way to the end, point Z. How's it going to happen? Well, you know the events that occurred, the failure of Elimelech and his family as they go into Moab, and the marriages, and the deaths, and the return of Naomi, and Ruth to the land of Bethlehem, to Bethlehem. The first thing is she became aware of a need. We have to eat. You're too old to go to the field. I guess it will have to be my responsibility to go to the field. So an obvious need drove her to the field. So there was, first of all, in the life of Ruth, there was an exercise created by circumstances. God may well create circumstances in your assembly that will lead you to realize a need exists. He may take away individuals who are very useful in certain spheres, and suddenly a huge vacancy occurs. I think it's a truism. We've all seen it in our lives, in our assemblies. We hardly value individuals and what they do until they're taken away. And then suddenly it dawns on us all they were doing, and no one is there to do it. So God may permit circumstances that make a need very, very evident. So with Ruth, there was an exercise created by circumstances, and she had to go to the field. Then there was her entry into the field. She just didn't think about it. She just didn't realize that there was a need that we're going to starve if we don't get food. She did something about it. She entered into the field, and she began laboring there in the field. She became employed in the field, and she labored. She labored. Whatever you are going to do for God, if it's going to be of any value, it's going to mean labor. There I use the word sacrifice. You recall that when you come to Hebrews chapter 13, I'm of, I've often remarked that the epistle, which dwells extensively on the fact that there are no longer any sacrifices to be made. When you come to chapter 13, he says, but wait a minute, there are two sacrifices. To do good and communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. So doing good and giving are sacrifices. So I can gauge the value of my service for God by what it's cost me. If my service has cost me nothing, then it's probably worth nothing. It's just something that I do out of convenience, that I can fit into my, my schedule just because I want to feel good that I'm doing something. It's likely not worth very much. It's supposed to be a sacrifice. A service is a sacrifice. So she went into the field and she labored from morning until night. Hard, arduous, I'm sure backbreaking in many ways. But she labored, and as a result of laboring, she gleaned and she was able to receive. But notice as well that in the field there was encouragement. She got encouragement from Boaz. You recall his words to her? All the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman, and he told the other servants to leave her handfuls and so on that she could pick up. So th there was encouragement for Ruth in the field, and there was encouragement and guidance that her mother-in-law, Naomi, gave her. And she wasn't touchy. She was willing to take the instruction from Naomi as well as the encouragement that she got from Boaz. And as a result of that, she labored. She had a teachable spirit vital to have a teachable spirit if you're going to be useful in the assembly, to allow others to instruct. That is one of the great values of older believers. You may think that your day of usefulness is gone, but it's not. One thing you can do is to encourage younger believers, to give them, I'm going to say, 
pearls of wisdom. Maybe that's a bit of an overstatement, but to give them the value of your experience. If nothing else, the mistakes you made when you were trying to do something. And uh, you may, they may be able to learn from your mistakes. So older believers can very well function to be a help to younger believers in trying to develop and understand and find their, their gift and all it, can, all it will bring them into. So becoming aware of need, <clears throat> being available to meet that need, not putting it off, thinking, well, I'm in school right now, I'm in college right now, my career is just beginning right now, our family is just beginning, beginning to grow right now. Don't put it off. Be available to meet need. Be active in that need and be approachable as others try to be a help to you in the development and use of that gift for God. Now that's, again, a very hurried, we could, we could apply the same to Samuel. He began by opening doors and he ends up by being a prophet of God. We could apply it to John. Standing by the cross, he's given a, a woman, a widow likely to care for. Had you been John, you would have said, wait a minute, I'm made for greater things than babysitting a widow. John just took her, took her from that hour to his own home, all of his things. And he moves from there to caring for an assembly, caring for a number of assemblies in Samaria, to, to caring for all the way to the end. And he's writing, writing a book that is going to be used by saints for the remainder of the dispensation. Began in a small way, God began to broaden his usefulness. That is what you'll find, that you begin in small ways, and God will gradually open doors and bring you to greater usefulness according to his will. But if God should just keep you at a small, rather, I'll use the word insignificant in our eyes, insignificant task, vacuuming the hall, cleaning the windows, whatever it may be, if that's what God has fitted you to do, no one else can do it as well. And we tragically, we tragically think that the measure of public usefulness, I'll use the word public usefulness, is what determines reward. The more public the person, the greater the reward. I want to disabuse you of that wrong thinking. God does not reward gift. God does not reward success. God rewards faithfulness with what he has given you to do. So if God has given you a Sunday school class to teach, and God has given someone else the ability to speak to large crowds in the gospel and see people saved, if each of you do what God has given you to do faithfully, you will come in for the same measure of reward at the judgment seat of Christ. Because God <coughs> rewards faithfulness, not success. Now, I've taken a lot of time, but my brethren here, jo Joseph, why don't you come in here? You're conscious of where younger believers are, maybe more than some of us are, some of we are, but... Uh... Yeah, I think this is probably the question everyone wants answered. Uh, what am I supposed to do? Um, I guess I would highlight what you said towards the end there on the, uh, the impact an older believer can have. Um, people were asking me when I came here, are you intimidated sitting with Sandy Higgins and the... Andrew uh, Andrew <laughs> And uh, the answer was yes. <laughs> but then, uh, secondly, you know, when I, after, shortly after I was baptized and I came up and was in fellowship, in the Bible reading right across from me was Norman Crawford. On the other side was an elder who knew his Bible by the name of Paul Fouts. And over here was a man named Jim Smith, who actually was around these parts for a while. So I know a little bit about being intimidated to say even amen. <laughs> and were it not for the encouragement of older Christians and their wives and other sisters who came along and saw the need when I didn't. Um, so I, I would just want to emphasize that, that sometimes it's the older Christians who see the need and when the young person is struggling to maybe use their summer to well, whatever you did, uh, TikTok, they say, hey, get busy. There's children's work that can be done in this little city. I uh, would like to take you around and do that. And I think mentoring is another side of things that I don't know if you want to address here, but vital to actually see anything change as far as people getting enrolled. I think it's helpful to recognize um, I mean, a lot of what Sandy has said has been focused on younger folks searching to find what my role might be. How do I fit in and what can I contribute? It's maybe helpful to just step back a little, uh, and it's been emphasized for folks that are in that sort of stage of life to recognize that it is the Lord behind the scenes 
that is ultimately moving the pieces around on the chessboard. It is his assembly. We are his people. The overseers don't own the assembly, they don't control the assembly. They are stewards. Titus refers to overseers as the stewards of God. So they are given. It's like David described his role to King Saul. Thy servant kept his father's sheep. That's what overseers do. Overseers are stewards of the father's children. Now that's a two-edged sword. So, I mean, we've said quite a, Sandy has said quite a bit about if you're younger or newer to an assembly, even if you're not young in age, and you're sort of wondering how you fit in and you know, what, what you can do to contribute, recognize it is God that opens doors. It is God that enables people. It is God that finds pegs to fill holes. And you know, if you want to use the, the, the image of a chess game, he's the one moving the pieces around. And he's very good at it. I say that reverently. He's capable of doing his work in you and with you and through you. But could I just sound sort of a balancing note to that? Important for older more entrenched, more experienced, uh, maybe longer standing in a particular assembly, believers, to recognize that same truth. If I could just say this without hurting anyone's feelings, it's not your assembly. It's God's. And if God is doing a work in younger ones or newer ones that he's bringing along and he's going to have roles for them to fill, please, kindly, you recognize the same thing and be on the lookout for that and be ready to see those roles filled and be ready to enable and equip those people to fill those roles and be ready if it means stepping back a little to, to leave opportunity for people to be used by God. Uh, there's a danger in people not being willing to be used. There is also a danger in people not willing to I can put it this way, to not be used. I'm going to, you know, I've given out the hymn books in this assembly for 74 years. I'm on my third hip. And by God's grace, I'll be here when I get number four, still giving out the hymn books. You don't need to. No, I'm not. I am not decrying faithfulness. Please, I'm not speaking disrespectfully to those older than myself. But we can all fall into that trap. Maybe especially overseers. We can sometimes get this idea that, you know, we have to do, no, you I, if there's other capable people in the assembly, harness them and maybe maintain as much as possible the focus of the overseers on the spiritual needs of the people of God uh, that the, the Lord will use them for. So I think there's two sides to that coin. If we all recognize that it's the Lord who is moving to equip, then we can all seek to be used in facilitating that work. Just to underline what you said there, uh, Mr. Usher, I think the discovery of my role that you have linked right after discipleship and has been expressed in the conference, good to remember that it's not some hidden secret. God is keeping your role hidden up there. And once you do the proper dance and a proper initiation, now he's going to reveal what you, Like, God wants you to function in your assembly the way he has formed you, gifted you, created you. He's not keeping it a secret. And so I think it's vital to link the two uh, that with discipleship and... Discovery of my rules. Could I ask both of you, brother, a question? Either one can come in. What is the link between natural ability and spiritual gift? Joseph, you already touched on this with talent versus gift in gospel preaching. So go ahead. Yeah. I think um, the same God gave the both, didn't he? <laughs> is that not the case? Did he not make us? Psalm 139 informed us. So um, to hyper-sanctify one would be, I think, a mistake. And I think as well, biblically, it would be brought out, and I don't know if you'll disagree with this, but that actually God takes somebody whose maybe natural ability is in such a, such a way. When they're saved, they're then sanctified with a spiritual gift, and often the two go together. Now, I know there's the exception of the guy who can't give a presentation in his class but can preach the gospel like Harold Paisley. And maybe there are such exceptions, but I think generally speaking, um, the rule would be that natural ability and spiritual gift are. So, uh, if this isn't too much of an exaggeration, God endows every human being with certain natural abilities with a view to that individual being saved and then those natural abilities wedded with a spiritual gift for the profit of others. Okay. So that an unsaved person is wasting even his natural talent. And that includes a Michael Jordan. It includes uh, 
whoever you want to think of, who have natural ability, even the great composers of symphonies and so on, God gave them certain natural abilities to be used in connection with a spiritual gift for his glory and the blessing of others. So unsaved individuals are wasting even what is naturally given to them by God in terms of their abilities and personalities. Could I just uh, talk a little, because I think this is where this would come in, in terms of the discovery of my role. Um, sometimes I think we need to expand our understanding of what roles there are um, to be filled in assembly life. Um, we sometimes, and many of the examples that have been used already today, including my, my examples, have had to do with the meetings of the assembly. So whether it's practical things like giving out hymn books or vacuuming or cleaning up or uh, speaking publicly or whatever. Um, interesting when you read the qualifications for an overseer that included in the, his character, uh, blameless and so on, included in his uh, spiritual burden and ability apt to teach. There's one that's thrown in there, given to hospitality or a lover of hospitality. You know, that is not generally shown in the meetings of the assembly. It's something which is linked to home life and his personal life. And given that the intention or the, the, the expectation is normally it's going to be a married man, it's something which is very linked to his wife. And so I would just like to, to say that a role in assembly life is not just when the assembly is gathered together. In fact, I would say there's a tremendous amount of value in the healthy functioning of an assembly, which is linked to the 90-something percent of the time in the course of a seven-day week when we are not publicly gathered together. So let me just say for sisters, as well as, as brothers, men, who I am and what I am outside of the six hours a week when we're publicly gathered together is part of my role in a local assembly, a vital part of my role in a local assembly. So if you're a sister here today, sometimes what's, you know, what's said may come across as patronizing. It might come across as, you know, um, just men are saying what sisters should do and so on. Could I just read to you, 1 Timothy, God's assessment of a worthwhile life from a widow, a woman who is well along in life, and she's now a widow. And it would appear that this is a woman who may have been a wife of an overseer or may not have been. But listen to what God values in her life. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, and I just want you to think of this in the context of a role in a local assembly. It says she's been the wife of one husband. That speaks to her uh, fidelity and her moral integrity. She's had a reputation for good works. I'm reading from the ESV. She has brought up children. She has shown hospitality. She has washed the feet of the saints. That is, she has served the believers tirelessly, even in insignificant menial tasks. She has cared for the afflicted, and she has devoted herself to every good work. It's possible that none of those clauses entered your mind when you were thinking of a role in a local assembly. And yet when Paul writes to Timothy and he, des he describes what God places value on in a life, those are the things that over the course of time this sister being described contributed to the assembly at Ephesus, where Timothy was when this was written. And again, I looked to my life, and I was raised by an aunt, <clears throat> hit every one of those. And over the years, demonstrated in her life an absolute, unrestricted commitment to the functioning of an assembly. Not in a public way, but by exactly this. By having a home that was open to the believers. By looking out for those. We had... Growing up in Toronto, I would say, without a word of exaggeration, I'm sure we had into the thousands of different believers in my aunt's home. Left a huge impression of me growing up. That was just normal. It wasn't abnormal at all. So there's many ways outside of public meetings that you have a role to fill in assembly life. 
There's, there's lots for all of us to do. Very good. I just, I just would like to ask one question, like from maybe the younger perspective. Both of you are overseers. One of the criticisms, at least I often hear, is regarding to elders. So let's just follow this through. Hypothetically, there's an assembly. There's a young person here who is aware of the need. No overseers, no elders. No, no one's doing anything. I'm just left alone. Okay, so let's follow, if you can help us follow it through and what that life looks like, maybe starting this weekend. What does that look like to follow these things practically? If they see this need in their assembly. If I understand the drift of what you're saying, I would think the first thing would be to approach the oversight and let them know I have an exercise to do this. Do I have your fellowship in what I'm doing? Now, if it's something very, very, very small, uh, they may not have to do that. But I would think their responsibility would be to move in concert with their brethren to make sure that they have the encouragement or at least the approval and then to move forward. And uh, to, to look for a mentor in the assembly somewhere, someone, uh, maybe not in the oversight, but someone else who can mentor them, encourage them, guide them, someone who they can be accountable to, and who can give them advice in their attempt to serve the Lord. Had you something more in mind, or maybe Andrew? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, th I think that's, that's good. The one, uh, and this is not at all to contradict you, Sandy, I know that you'll agree. The one thing I would suggest, start with prayer. Remember, it is God's assembly. It, it, it is his. And he is aware of all the current, I was going to say the current players. I don't mean that in a pejorative way. The, the current members of the assembly and the different roles that are being already filled. He's aware of all of that and he's aware of you. He is able, in, in prayer, he is able to strip away what in me might just be selfish ambition. What in me might be a desire for place? What in me might be a lashing out critically of what's going on? If I'm willing to let him do that, he's able to strip that away and leave behind only what's pure in motive in my own heart. So start with prayer. Critical, surrendering, self-deprecating prayer about your burden for the assembly. And then I think you, you look, you'll become aware of need and, and reach out to other people and so on. But keep the Lord in it, because that's what keeps our own souls right. And if I'm doing it for him, that will blunt a lot of the, what you have at the very end here, criticism. That'll blunt the fleshly reaction that comes when I don't feel appreciated, or when my head gets chopped off, or when I get misunderstood. Or, so I would really keep the Lord in any functioning in an assembly. Good. Thank you. Why don't you go ahead? Okay, so development of your gift. Uh, I would just say, maybe if we've lost anyone, the reason for taking up a, a subject like this is because we have to understand that we are all, no one's on the bench, right? No one's observing as a spectator. We're all involved, the demand, we have to all be following Christ as his people, discover what he has us to do, and now developing it, understanding that nobody starts uh, at 12th grade, we all started at kindergarten, okay? Um, so because I know so many of you, especially uh, my burden in taking this up is for the younger people, uh, you know, the first time I took the gospel was not at a conference, okay? And the first time, I think, Mr. Higgins and Mr. Usher taught the Word of God was not at Midland Park Conference. We start small. We start with Sunday school, and even sometimes smaller than that. And as far as it being a process Again, if a personal comment is not out of place, I asked the dear brother who would record the gospel meeting for that tape copy back then, and I would do the very painful exercise of listening to myself preach the gospel. And it was painful, <laughs> is what it says here, and sure was. And everything that everyone else forgives, and all the dear sisters, because most of them are the ones who encourage you, all the dear sisters who would be a great encouragement, uh, you kind of come, come to find out how many awkward things you say and how hard it is for people to hear. And go through the process and do, try to make the next time better. If God has given you a gift, don't settle for mediocre. You don't settle for that in business. You don't settle for that in athletics. Give him your best and go through the process. But again, highlighting what is said here, it is slow. Um, even it says of the Lord Jesus, he grew in wisdom and stature. Even the Lord Jesus began by asking questions as the boy of 12 and answering. He didn't begin by giving uh, teaching. Hard work, I guess that again comes down to it. It's, it's going to, again, circling back to uh, the beginning, it's going to take commitment. 
It's not going to come easy to know and to, well, it might be a little bit easier to know my role, but to actually function as a gift in the kind of the Ephesians 4 sense, that the gift is actually the man to the church. To actually function as a gift to your local assembly, you're going to have to put uh, the effort in. Um, Mr. Higgins has highlighted here the time, the discipline, and here discouragement, disappointment, delay, and defections. Uh, yes, uh, again, I, I hate to just, like, I can only speak of, again, how the Lord has, uh, the role he has given me. I can tell you that there was a time in my life, uh, in my late teens, where I spent most of my week um, passionately involved in college football. And then I would show up on Sunday and sing the lives, right, and quote the verses or whatever. And uh, when I started understanding the solemnity of what we've heard, the judgment seat of Christ, and the fact that your life is either is going to be reviewed and either waste or something for God, um, well, I started to take a little bit more part. I got way more encouragement when I would give a hymn once a month. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. You know, when you start to take more, there is criticism that comes. So I don't know how else to say it, but be prepared for that. Don't let that discourage you. It does come from the carnality within all of us. Perhaps we've all been critical when we shouldn't have been and had to confess that. But criticism will come when gift is exercised. I'm speaking now like a public gift, but any gift. Somebody who's picking up the Sunday school kids, bringing them in, and then they um, put on something afterward, well, they're criticized for doing that, right? There are no end of uh, critiques. Um, it says it can be painful, and that is, of course, true. It can be something that really uh, stifles you, keeps you up at night. You can be very discouraged um, by criticism that can come, especially if it's unwarranted, unscriptural. Uh, what's encouraged me, uh, Mr. Higgins has listed a few men here, Moses, Joseph, Nehemiah, and Paul. You know what it says of the Lord Jesus when he returned to Nazareth? Is not this the carpenter's son? Again, just keep in mind Christ when you're functioning. Keep in mind that the Son of God on planet Earth faced criticism when he opened the book and everyone's eyes was fastened on him. And they still get, had criticism. So uh, it's just a fact, I think. Uh, you, I don't even know why I'm taking this one. You men can have way more yeah. to say about this than I, I would as far as development. <clears throat> Relative to criticism, um, would you say, would you agree that even when it appears to be unjustified, to look for some kernel mm -hmm. of potential value in that criticism mm -hmm. that I can now take and possibly uh, use it to in improve my, my service. I mean, there may be a, a small kernel of truth in a very undeserved barrage of criticism, and yeah. I should look for that and try to profit from it, yeah. not just become bitter by it. Right. Okay. Could I suggest, um, I, I don't want to harp on this alone, but I'm back now on the subject of my relationships with others within the assembly. Um, it's already been said today that tremendous damage is caused in assemblies uh, by breakdowns in interpersonal relationships, clashes, personality clashes or fleshly outbursts or whatever you want to call them. The inverse is also true, that tremendous strength is built into assembly fellowship by the interpersonal relationships among believers. Here's a little exercise that all of us can do. Go through the New Testament, use your Bible software or search program, and look for one another yeah. through the epistles. Mm -hmm. And all of the exhortations, there's literally dozens of them, 32. specific exhortations about how we are to interact with one another. We're to love one another. We're to feed one another. We're to, there's a whole range of things that we are to do for one another. Every one of those represents an opportunity to serve in a local assembly context. And I would suggest that identifying those, pouring your life into implementing those, those are the steps towards building, building in strength to the functioning of an assembly. It's not always a, 
uh, I was struck recently that we, what we like, and maybe it's just my personality, but I think a lot of people share it, we like certainty. We want a defined project. We want a, a, a task given to us. This is my niche. This is my role. I can get my team together. I can deliver on this. I can... Have you ever noticed that a lot of people the Lord used never actually knew that they were being prepared to be used in a certain way? Sandy has brought Ruth to our attention. She had no concept when she married one of Malin. Was she Malin or Chilean? Or do we even know? Chilean. There we go. Sandy knows. When she married this son of Naomi, she had no idea how the story was going to unfold. You think of Joseph of Arimathea in the New Testament, a rich man, likely was criticized for being a rich man. He owned a tomb, which was a you know, pretty good status symbol to have a hand-hewn tomb near Jerusalem or just out. He didn't know until the time came that, that think of the man that had the upper room. There was a man that had an upper room that was going to be used for the final Passover, the institution of the Lord's Supper. It was just a room. You think of the man that had the donkey or the colt that was tied up. And there's numerous examples. The Lord, I want to say it reverently, he's the chess master. He's the one moving the pieces. He's the one that knows all of the resources. He is, to use another scriptural description, the Lord of the harvest. There is a Lord of the harvest. There is someone who's in control. It's not an earthly committee. And he will marshal his resources and use his resources to further his purposes. So it's not always going to be a nice, tidy, self-gratifying, packaged role. And I sign up for it, and I live my life doing it, and I die a happy man. Not necessarily. You just serve. The other thing, just to add for further encouragement to what our brother has said, Think of all of those examples he's given us, from Joseph of Arimathea to the owner of the cult to the man with the upper room. They never realized all that their service accomplished. I don't think Joseph realized that he was making it possible to verify the resurrection of Christ. Had to be a tomb no one had ever been in before, a tomb with only one entrance and one exit. I mean, everything about the tomb makes the apologetic of the resurrection so certain. And likewise, the, I wonder if the man who gave the cult realized he was going to be, enable the Lord Jesus to fulfill prophecy. You go through all the examples of individuals. Likewise, Ruth had no idea she was going to be an ancestor. She thought she was just assuring the legacy of her dead husband. But God had something far greater in view. So your little day of service, your little acts of service are like stones in a pond and the ripples keep growing all the way out to eternity. So we should be encouraged to seek to do whatever we can do, despite disappointments, despite discouragements, despite seeing others defect and go elsewhere, to give all we have to God's assembly and to the people of God and their welfare. And as we read in 1 Peter chapter 4, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. To keep that in view, it is the glory of God that is, that should be paramount in all that we do for him. I should just mention, just as an addendum, in case there are other young believers want to jot this down, four chapters in your New Testament that have to do with this foreboding word gift. Two are chapter 4s, two are chapter 12s, so they're easy to remember. Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 4, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12. That covers, in a large measure, what the New Testament has to say about the subject of gifts for us. So I want to thank our brethren for their excellent contributions.